Freud in Perspective, one in a series of programs dealing with some of the discoveries and errors of Sigmund Freud, a series titled, Man is Not a Thing. First, you will hear Dr. Eric Fromm, psychoanalyst and author, as recorded in his study in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Then you will meet Robert Nisbet, Dean of the College of Letters and Science, University of California, Riverside. Together with Floyd Moss, Professor of World Religions of the Southern California School of Theology, and Dr. Edward Rudin, Chief Psychiatrist of the California State Mental Hygiene Clinic in Riverside. Now, here is Eric Fromm, as interviewed by John Harder in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Dr. Fromm, Sigmund Freud was a product of his time, but here, these years later, could we ask the question, why was it Freud? Was it the time, or was it the man? Well, I would say uh, it is both, and we have to consider what relationship any great genius has to his time? We might say on the one hand that his great ideas are ideas which represent something new for his time. They lead the thinking or even the feeling of people beyond what they have been thinking and feeling up to then. Uh, this is the new thing every genius offers. But at the same time, every genius, even the greatest one, is a child of his time. That is to say, he himself is caught in certain premises of a philosophic nature, of general views on life, which are those of his time, and which restrict even him, and which therefore mold and form his own ideas so that they are never entirely out of his time. Well, what were the premises of his time? I would say uh, that one uh, could mention two basic premises of his time. One, a premise which is characteristic, or which was characteristic, for all scientific thinking in the later part of the 19th century, and that premise one might call the physiological materialism. Now, what do I mean by physiological materialism? Mm -hmm. Simply the idea that everything mental was understood to be caused, determined, to be rooted in something physiological in something of the body. And you felt you had explained satisfactorily a mental phenomenon if you had found the bodily root, the mm -hmm. physiological root in the organism. This was a method of the physiologist, and this was the ideal of scientific thought at that time, just as today theoretical physics formed the ideal frame of reference for scientific thinking, even in the social sciences. That's one premise. And then there's another premise which goes even further back, which goes back to the 18th century, namely the premise of rationalism. That by our intellect, we can not only understand all that which is not intellectual, that is to say the emotional forces within the individual and within society, but we can also control it. The ideal of uh, this kind of philosophy was the control of the irrational by the rational. Or, you might put it this way, the control of passion by intellect. And actually, this ideal was Freud's, and his whole therapy is an attempt, essentially, to control the irrational passions of men by the intellectual understanding of these passions. Mm -hmm. Well, how did Freud himself depart from these premises of his time? Well, he departed in one very essential way. For all the thinkers before him, for all the rationalists before him, that which was worthy of observation and investigation was only that which was in itself rational. Uh, or to put it differently, what they felt was that the only psychic context or contents worthy of observation and study was the thought which we are aware of. The great discovery of Freud was that he created, so to speak, a third dimension in this field. That he saw that what goes on in us is not only that which we are aware of, but that there is a larger province in ourselves which motivates us, which drives us, which determines our action and feeling, and that this larger province is outside of our awareness that it exists within us, and yet it lives without our awareness. 
And so he coined the new word of the unconscious, of that which is real within ourselves and yet that which we know nothing about. And of course, this had a tremendous influence on our whole view of man. Take, for instance, simply the example of sincerity. Up to Freud, a person was sincere if he said that which he was aware of. With the discovery of the unconscious, a person, this is not enough to define sincerity because he may be aware of certain things and quite honest if he says, these are my motivations, and yet a great deal of what motivates him, he is not aware of. And sincerity in this third dimension then means that I am not only acting according to what I know, but acting according to what I don't know. And the method of Freud was exactly to find out that area which I don't know. Then it's your feeling that one of his main discoveries was the discovery of the unconscious. In what area was this, this discovery made? Well, the area was given by Freud's profession, namely the area of psychiatry and psychotherapy. He discovered first the unconscious in the neurotic symptom. He saw, and uh, with him his teacher Breuer, that many neurotic symptoms were caused by motives in the person of which the person was not aware. And that unconsciously, in the neurotic symptom, the person is acting out a desire or a craving which consciously he is not aware of. So that the neurotic symptom is a kind of disguised form of expressing the unconscious wish, but blended with those defenses against the unconscious wish, which then, in their combination, form the symptom. That was the first field and the main field in which he discovered the unconscious. And he succeeded not only in stating this theoretically, but curing people by finding out what was this unconscious wish behind their symptom. The second great field, and really perhaps the masterwork of Freud, was to uncover the unconscious in our dreams. We all dream, and yet we are remarkably unsurprised by the strangeness of our dreams. What Freud discovered in dreams was that in our dreams, unconscious tendencies, which are completely forgotten in the daylight, appear and form the contents of a dream. So that not only could he understand a neurotic symptom, but also the absurd contents of a dream, which if one understands the unconscious motivation in the dream and the peculiar way in which these unconscious tendencies are expressed, make one understand the whole of a dream as something perfectly clear, something which makes perfectly good sense. From there on, Freud proceeded to understand other phenomena which were hardly understood before him, namely the vast realm of those productions of the human race which we call myth and fairy tales. The myth also had appeared as something perhaps childish, something which was a rather useless play of the human imagination, while Freud could show, just as with a dream, that in the myth also, tendencies, ideas, wishes, which we are not aware of, are expressed and strangely mixed and blended with our conscious tendency. And for the first time, perhaps, Freud showed that the myth, like the dream, makes sense, provided we only understand the symbolic language which is employed and the unconscious ideas which find expression in the myth. You say that this was a discovery uniquely of Freud's. Uh, was the idea of an unconscious uh, function uh, going on uh, uh, ignored or unavailable to, uh, to men, was this entirely a new idea at his time? No, it certainly wasn't. And I think uh, this holds true for all great new ideas. They never appear for the first time. Now, I could mention two examples where the idea of the unconscious was shown and understood quite clearly. One is in Spinoza, quite a few hundred years before Freud. Spinoza raised the question, why do we all think that we are free in our decisions, that we have completely free will? And his answer was, because we know our desires, but we are not aware of the motivations for our desires. This is very clearly the same concept of the unconscious which we find in Freud. 
or let me quote a philosopher uh, who lived uh, more or less at the same time, the great German philosopher Nietzsche, who once said, my memory tells me that I have done this. My pride tells me I could not have done it. And my memory yields. Mm. There again you have the same idea. But, as it happens so often, the greatness of Freud was that he did not just make a remark about this, but he saw the full importance of this discovery for the whole understanding of human life, of normal life and of pathological life, and devoted a lifetime to elaborate this very idea which in itself some other great people had discovered before him. You have heard Dr. Eric Fromm, psychoanalyst and author, as recorded in his study in Cuernavaca, Mexico. Now to continue our discussion of Freud in perspective, we'll switch to Studio C at San Bernardino Valley College where we'll join Robert Nisbet of the University of California, Riverside, Professor Floyd Ross of the Southern California School of Theology, and Dr. Edward Rudin, Chief Psychiatrist of the Riverside State Mental Hygiene Clinic. Dean Nisbet is our moderator. Well, gentlemen, if, like me, you have been uh, uh, provoked at times, stimulated at times by Eric Fromm's remarks, I'm sure you will also have reactions to it. I certainly do, but I'd like to hear first from Dr. Rudin, who, being a psychiatrist, is in a sense most in line to be the first uh, respondent here. Ed? Well, I think that Dr. Fromm has... Uh proved uh, that he belongs in the ranks of the genius himself uh, by having made uh, very explicit uh, in these uh, few moments uh, what has perhaps been implicit for all of us. Uh, certainly I would have uh, some questions uh, about uh, the oversimplifications which are involved in any kind of uh, making explicit but I would certainly uh, agree wholeheartedly that uh, if one needs to single out a single contribution of Freud's uh, that uh, the contribution of an awareness of uh, the unconscious processes of man and the development of a system to explain these unconscious processes is really the major contribution of this genius. Uh, I wonder, though, as a uh, professor of uh, religions, uh, what you would think about this, uh, Professor Ross. Well, I would agree with Dr. Fromm very definitely when he uses that nice phrase, a third dimension to describe something of the contribution that Freud made in understanding man and his behavior. For I think that the important thing that Dr. Fromm has pointed out here is that Freud wanted people to become more aware of those areas of their unconscious life which got them into all kinds of difficulties. Now, I would agree also that there were various weaknesses in Freud's approach, and particularly in some of the area of his theorizing. Perhaps, Dean Nesbitt, you would like to comment on that, however. Well, the reaction that I referred to a moment ago is one of a kind of historian of ideas, especially of this period. What continually impresses me about Freud is a remarkable relevance of his central ideas today in light of the obsolete, even false, nature of so many of the anthropological and sociological underpinnings of what he gave us. Like so many of the anthropologists of his own time, he attempted to take a present phenomenon and to relate it to some supposed absolute origin in the development of mankind. Now, none of this anthropology today is recognized by professional anthropologists as being valid anthropology. We're a little more modest today, are we not, in our attempts to uh, work on these anthropological problems, whereas the people in the continent of Europe in the 19th century were quite willing to make a broad generalization regarding the conditions of the human race in the beginning. That's very true, Professor Ross, and also anthropologists today are simply asking different kinds of questions. True. But, uh, Dean is, but, uh, Sigmund Freud was not an anthropologist or a sociologist, and uh, he was an examiner of individuals. He was primarily an investigator, uh, he began his work by operating in a biology laboratory, and he continued to operate in a kind of biology laboratory for the rest of his days. 
uh, although he got out of the sterility of the laboratory into uh, perhaps a different kind of sterility of the, uh, the couch in the office. Mm -hmm. uh, he continued, though, to investigate and continued to listen to people. He continued to work with patients, and as he uh, developed a clinical approach, uh, he uh, continued to be able to check and recheck concepts that he was developing, continued to test out his hypotheses against what patients were uh, saying and telling him. Uh, and it seems to me that this may uh, have something to do then uh, with the fact that despite the faults of the sociologic or anthropologic um, premises uh, that lay behind some of his uh, formulations, that the basic concepts of the symbolism of the unconscious mind, the basic concepts of the motivations of the human being, uh, that these were, were being checked against patients and consequently continue to be valid today. Well, Dr. Rudin, I think you've put your finger on the point of my question. I would infer from what you say that whereas in the clinic, Freud was on the whole the exacting and careful scientist, that where we would find him at fault today is where he chose to ornament or to provide underpinnings in areas outside of his own competence. And these areas outside his competence are not really, although Freud himself at the time may have thought they were central, they are not really central to the support of his theory. Well, isn't it true that even up to the end of his life, he was still willing to revise some of these earlier theories? And the very fact that he had kept close to the clinical situation was a kind of corrective. I honor him for being willing to stretch his imagination and make some rather broad leaps at times, for I think too many clinical workers are unwilling to try to generalize. On the other hand, in his Moses and Monotheism book, he certainly went overboard in a way that no historical critic would follow him, and in his Totem and Taboo, I think he went a long ways without any supporting evidence. But he was teachable, clear to the end. And I think this, uh, perhaps, is one aspect of his greatness in addition to those mentioned by Dr. Fromm. Wouldn't you agree, Dr. Rubin? I would agree, uh, Professor Ross. I think that uh, we must recognize uh, that Freud was uh, as startled by what he was discovering as any of the people were who heard him report his discoveries uh, very much later. We know this because there was such a, a time lag between the period when he was making his investigations and the uh, time of his first publications of what he was discovering. He was quite startled by what he had discovered. And it seems to me that some of these writings in the uh, parapsychiatric or parapsychological literature or on parapsychological subjects were uh, a part of his trying to work through for himself the uniqueness of what he himself had found. Uh, Freud uh, never pretended to be a uh, student of uh, sociology or of anthropology and uh, in many places cites his lack of information really in these areas. And yet he somehow found it necessary to branch into these fields, and certainly his own imagination, certainly his own interest in human beings would lead him in this direction, but I think also that he was led in this direction because he uh, was so overwhelmed by what he had discovered that he had to incorporate this into a, a stronger system. And then it is certainly true that when he went back to his patients and listened to them further, and listened to the reports of some of his colleagues using his techniques with patients, that he had uh, this wonderful capacity to give up some of his concepts, to revise some of his concepts, to keep moving with the new discoveries that he was making. Oh, yes. I certainly uh, have the highest respect for that flexible quality of Freud's mind that seemed to remain flexible to the very end. And when I referred a while ago to what I feel is his bad anthropology or his bad sociology, let me make one thing clear. I'm not suggesting that Freud himself was a bad anthropologist in the late 19th century among good anthropologists or sociologists. Far from it. He was giving, on the whole, very accurate rendering of what was regarded as the good anthropology and sociology of that time. Every student of the family, of the state, of marriage, of religion, always felt it necessary to take his subject back, if he could, to the primordial beginnings of human society. Every worker in the areas of sociology and anthropology took it for granted at that time 
that the living primitive races could be regarded as examples of European man's own cultural beginnings. Almost every uh, psychologist, I think of G. Stanley Hall in this country and others in Europe, took it for granted that there is a suggestive analogy between childhood in our society and the primitive man. These are errors by our advanced knowledge in anthropology today, but Freud was a part of his own time, and we can hardly blame him for accepting what the best anthropologists of the day presented. True. Ross? Didn't he share also a presupposition that was pretty common in the intellectual circles of his day, namely that the patriarchal family was the normal type of family? Didn't some of his theorizing assume an original patriarchy? It did, and there is another aspect of Freud's emphasis upon the father. We can perhaps discuss this a little bit more usefully later. But the age in which Freud was living, the end of the 19th century, of course, I realize that he came well down into the 20th, but the age in which he began his thinking was an age of very sharp social change so far as the kinship structure of the European family was concerned. This was an age in which, under the impact of the Industrial Revolution, democracy, and some of the ideas of equalitarianism that were beginning to uh, pervade Eastern Europe, an age in which the patriarchal structure of the family was under very sharp challenge. And Freud, I can't help thinking, as the clinician, as the scientist, was reacting in many ways to pressures of the change going on in the society about him. Wasn't this uh, change in the society, though, also a change which uh, led people to be curious about what made things work, this very intimately related to the Industrial Revolution, uh, so that the concept of the unconscious mind, which was not new, as has been pointed out uh, here, uh, was not a new concept or one that was uniquely Freud's. Uh, this concept, though, could be explored now because people were taking machinery apart and assuming the machinery of the human mind was another machine that needed to be taken apart wasn't this what enabled Freud to uh, not be satisfied with just saying there are unconscious processes, uh, but that these unconscious processes uh, work in a kind of system, that there uh, are parts to it, that there is a method even in the uh, irrational unconscious of human beings? That's right. He apparently assumed that these irrational processes took place according to certain dependable laws of structure, and this fitted into the general character of the time. He was not assuming that the irrational was so completely irrational that one could not understand it. No, and he was not assuming that it was so completely irrational as to be untouchable by the rational parts of ourselves, too. Yeah. Quite right. He always had the ideal of the rationalist. There is this difference, though, I think, between Freud and some of the other rationalists of the age. Men like Herbert Spencer, for example, were perfectly aware of the irrationalities in the society around them, but in their progressive, in the zeal, I should say, of their own philosophy of progress, they were quite convinced that mankind was quickly evolving to a point where all evil would be eradicated as man's adjustment to his environment became ever more perfect. Now, I think Freud, for all of his rationalism, uh, delivered a great blow to complacency in Western Europe. The easy, comfortable optimism of the Victorian age must have been hit awfully hard by the implications of Freud's argument. Yes, these people were in a position where they did not want to recognize that some of the things Freud was saying might be true. Those of us who live after two world wars in the 20th century can now appreciate something of what Freud was beginning to unlock when he made his clinical investigations in terms of disturbed persons. I believe that uh, one of the reasons that Freud uh, may have uh, uh, had this kind of uh, different approach to rationalism was his contact with patients. The fact that he could not be complacent as long as he was working with neurotically disturbed people. Uh, he could not uh, assume a certain uh, uh, millennium uh, as long as he was working with the problems of individuals and as long as he was able to understand the symbolism that they were bringing him. 
true, but don't you feel, uh, Dr. Rudin, that there was more than contact with disturbed patients? There was also his fundamental conviction that the nature of man, given its long evolutionary past, will never become wholly beneficent and entirely adapted to the demands that society impresses upon all of us. We know from uh, Freud's later writings that this is the way he felt. Whether he felt this way when he first began to work, uh, I really don't know. Uh, later, in the 30s, uh, his, uh, his books, uh, his monographs, certainly uh, present a, a quite pessimistic picture of the culture and of the society. Again, I don't know uh, just how pessimistic he was earlier in his work. He seemed to be fairly confident that there could be a kind of re-educational process undertaken. And it seems to me that this is one area where he really did give, as a good teacher to later teachers, a bundle of keys to open up new avenues of exploration. For example, Dr. Fromm referred to one of them, the new approach to myth. We're just beginning to explore in this area. It's going to throw a lot of light into some of the semi-darkened areas of the study of religions, including the study of Judaism and Christianity. Freud didn't go into this in too great detail, and some of the things that he said in his initial writings we have since seen to be rather wide of the mark, but he's opened up an avenue that may help us come to grips with some of these submerged processes. He produced a, an instrument, he produced a device, which he himself right. referred to as the microscope uh, in understanding human nature, which can then be used by others uh, to make further discoveries. That's right. Well, gentlemen, I think we've probably reached the point where we might summarize in a few seconds if I have understood the discussion here at the table and keeping in mind Dr. Fromm's earlier remarks we might say that Freud's great contributions contributions which are relevant today as they were yesterday in the first place is emphasis upon the latent the unconscious and the irrational aspects of human behavior in the second place, his exhaustive analyses of the influence of early childhood upon the development of the human being. And finally, his calling of attention to the whole area of myth, fantasy, and dream, which, when properly interpreted, throws so much light not only upon the individual himself, but the history of the human race. Would you, on the whole, agree with my summary of Freud's contribution in its larger outlines? Yes. Good. Mm -hmm. If so, I think we can conclude, and our thanks to you, Dr. Ed Rudin, Chief Psychiatrist of the Riverside State Mental Hygiene Clinic, and to you, Dr. Floyd Ross, Professor of World Religions, the Southern California School of Theology in Claremont. <laughs>